Good morning and welcome to our service at Lister Hill. It's been a bit of a roller coaster ride this week. We're, we've been praying for somebody in our uh, church and um, uh, a young girl, uh, age three, and she had a stroke and it brought the church together in prayer. And her grandfather, I remember, he, um, he texted us and said, we're going to worship, will you join us? And that really struck a chord with me because I thought, you know, will you pray? And as I was, as I was praying and worshiping, I realized that actually sometimes we don't know what to say to God, but he knows what our heart is and all we can do is worship. And when we do worship, it ushers in the supernatural because we've tried to exhaust all the natural things that we can do. When really what we should be doing as soon as we hit a problem in our life that we need God to um, sort out, so to speak, is that we should immediately go to the supernatural and say, Father, help. I was listening to a song called Defender and I just want to read uh, a few lines of the lyrics that have um, helped me through this week um, as I was praying and worshipping. It starts off like this. You go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. You come back with the head of my enemy. You come back and you call it my victory. And all I did was praise. And all I did was worship. And all I did was bow down. And all I did was stay still. Hopefully there'll be a, a, a link in the description to that song. I, I'd encourage you to have a listen to that. But as we, we stand together and, and worship the living God, let's just think about that that when we do worship, we usher in the supernatural. So if you're struggling this week with whatever it is, and there's no breakthrough, if you're struggling with strongholds, then just worship and let God do what God does best. Break in through supernatural means and miraculous things will happen. So let's do that. Father God, we thank you that you are the God of the miraculous. Father, we thank you that you go before us and you fight our battles for us. And you call it our victory. But Lord, we, we know it's you. So we thank you for claiming those victories for us every day. Help us now to worship you in spirit and in truth. And as we do, Lord, I pray that you break down strongholds, that you help us in our hours of need. In Jesus' name, amen.
opportunity to bring your praise to the Father.
promise still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail come on promise still stands great is your lift Nigel now before you Lord and we ask that you would fill him afresh with your spirit that you would bless him as he blesses you with your word Lord I pray that as he speaks the words he speaks will impact our hearts and minds it will affect change in our whole being we will be moved into action Good morning. It's good to be able to come and share God's word uh, with you this morning. And uh, I'd just like to say that God has given me a word uh, or pointed me to a passage uh, a few weeks ago. So I've been thinking about this for a little while, but it's remarkable, isn't it? How God's word is relevant, it's pertinent, it's a now thing. And we come to him uh, and he shares his heart with us uh, and speaks to us in our in our moment in our now in in the here and uh, and so we come to listen to hear what God has to say to us. I want to share this morning's word from Genesis chapter twenty eight and I'm going to read from verse ten to the end of the chapter so genesis chapter twenty eight and this is the story of Jacob. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep. He thought, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Lutz. When Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I will... I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house. Then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you 
a tenth. Let's pray for a moment. Father, we thank you for your word and we ask that you would speak to us through it. Speak to us through the reading of it. Speak to us as we uh, look more closely at what some of the things are that it's saying to us, to us today. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and bring us a revelation of God's heart this morning. Amen. So what's the background to this particular story? Jacob, who is the grandson of Abraham and the uh, son of Isaac, his slightly older brother Esau, uh, which he was a twin. And uh, Jacob is a mummy's boy. Jacob and his mum really uh, connive a bit together. Uh, and certainly Jacob is one who deceives to get what he wants, whether he's entitled to it or not. He even purchased purchased his brother's own birthright, perhaps something that's more significant, the, the inheritance from his father uh, and the blessing that was due to the eldest son uh, he took away from uh, his brother Esau by deception. So we uh, follow on from those incidents where uh, Esau, uh, his, Esau's response to what Jacob has done is to threaten him, uh, to kill him when he catches up with him after a period of mourning for their father's death. And so we see Jacob running away from Esau and heading off to uh, his uncle Laban's house, which is about 500 miles north. So it's not just a quick journey. It's not even just a jaunt down to London uh, or up to John O'Groats in the car. It's, it's a long way if you're going on foot. And uh, Haran is uh, in southeastern Turkey. So I suspect that Jacob was probably feeling quite down, alone, in a tough and vulnerable place, perhaps even in a dark place. And he stopped for the night. And in a kind of way, symbolic of how he, his life was at the moment, he took a, a stone and made it for a pillow. When you and I get into bed after a, a tough day or... Uh, a tough week, all we want to do is just crawl into bed and just relax with a nice pillow under our heads. Well, this wasn't like that. No soft, cosy pillow for Jacob, just a rock to put your head on. But there he had the most amazing dream. And although it was a dream, it was clearly a full-blown encounter with God. Not just something in the imagination. And he dreamed that he saw angels going up and down a ladder. And at the top of the ladder is God himself. And this encounter that God has with Jacob then uh, brings about God renewing the covenant promises or making those promises with Jacob that he'd previously made with his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac. He promises Jacob that he will bless him and make him fruitful and through him that he will bless all the peoples of the earth. This encounter raises a number of things that I believe God wants to speak to us this morning about and which are relevant to us personally today. And I believe uh, as I shared at the beginning, that God gave me this passage to look at uh, a couple of weeks ago, before the time, certainly for our family, when uh, we have experienced a, a difficult season of life, uh, with Florence being Pauline in hospital, and Tim and Sarah moving house in the midst of all of that. And this is an indication of how timely God's word can be for us. So let's have a look at some of these things together and maybe one or more of these things that we're going to look at will speak into our lives at the moment and even if they don't they're things that we need to grapple with as we seek to to grow in the likeness of Jesus. So this part of Jacob's life in many ways is a pointer to the gospel message, the message that's yet to come thousands of years ahead of time in when Jesus comes to earth. 
It shows us God's grace. It shows us that God doesn't give us what we deserve. For example, if you were God and you'd been watching Jacob take his older brother's birthright for a bowl of soup and deceive his way into his father's deathbed blessing and he turns up in your presence, what would you do? You'd probably punish him or at the very least discipline him for what he's done. And if you did punish him, you'd very much deserve it. But fortunately, you and I are not God. He gives by grace. He gives what our behaviour does not warrant. It's his undeserved favour. And the gospel, or good news, uh, is, as Paul puts it, by grace from first to last. It's nothing that we deserve. Jacob did not deserve this. So there is no entitlement here to this blessing. It comes entirely by God's grace. He was not good enough. He did not deserve it. And he certainly didn't earn it. There are times when we feel like we're not good enough for God's blessing. And that perhaps because of our behaviours, all that we deserve is punishment. And that would be true. But God still gives us his grace. And he still blesses us on our journey in life. And there is a tension here. Jacob has received his father's blessing and has the birthright. However, he came across it. He was entitled to the blessing. For those of us who are Christians and have received all of the promises God has given to us. Are we entitled? To hear us when we cry out to him. Are we not entitled to his blessings because we are his children? There is a tension between grace and entitlement or inheritance to use a phrase that Paul uses in the New Testament. A tension of being blessed and yet not exempt from life's hard circumstances. In some ways, the image of the angels and the ladder speak into this. Note the words very clearly say that the angels go up from earth to heaven and then come down. So there is a, a legitimacy in the crying out to God from our own lives here on earth. And we have needs to bring to God. And the angels are there to go up into heaven and to bring down from heaven that which we've asked for. But also there is a sovereignty about who God is and that he gives us blessing just because he loves us. And in giving us blessing, sometimes that blessing is not to give us what we've asked for. What perhaps we believe we're entitled to as his children. But what we do know is that God gives us good things because he is good. And God can only give us what he himself has, which is why God cannot give us bad things. Jesus talked about that in the Sermon on the Mount. He doesn't give stones and scorpions when what we need is a fish or a nice pillow. As God's children, we are entitled to the fulfilment of his promises but it is always by grace, grace from first to last. And so there is a tension that we need to hold in our hearts, the tension of grace and entitlement. Moving on in the story, it would be fair to say from this passage that we have no indication that Jacob was looking for God on this journey. Equally, we have nothing that says he wasn't. But at the heart of this passage is the encounter with God. No less real for it having been in a dream 
And sometimes God has to move aside our conscious brain and thinking and deal with the subconscious because sometimes our thinking gets in the way. And our subconscious can it be even more powerful than our conscious. All the significant things in what was about to happen and what happened in uh, Jacob's life from here on happened because of this encounter. His calling, his purpose, the promises, the covenant, the worship. They all flow out of what God was saying, what God was doing in this encounter. Jacob's response to this encounter was that God is in this place. That this is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And I was not even aware of it. And this raises uh, a most significant of questions. And that question is, where are you, God? Where are you in my crisis? The one I'm having right now. Where are you? I can't feel your presence. I can't see you. I can't sense you being there. And I'm struggling to be at rest. My pillow is a rock. Where are you, God? And what are you doing? In some ways, God had already answered that question for him in two ways. First and foremost, by turning up. And having that encounter with him. But the second was by making this covenant promise. Which is a promise for each one of us. In verse 15. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Let me just read that again. It's a, it's a huge, huge promise. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you which is just a totally amazing promise. God will not leave me, God will not leave you until he has done and fulfilled every promise that he has made. And that promise reminds me of the promise that's in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God is working for our good. And as Bill Johnson says, if it's not good, if my circumstances, my situation, my life is not good, God is still working. Because God is working for your good. And that is true of this promise that we read here. If there is a promise that has not yet been fulfilled in your life, God is still with you and is still working and so there is a tension here too. God says he will be with me, but I can't feel his presence. And we have to hold these tensions in our hearts. In the Christian culture that we live in today, Lister Hill and, and many churches like Lister Hill, we believe that God is present. That he works miracles and changes lives and circumstances. And this is true. And yet what we believe, those truths, we do not yet see in any frequent and regular way. One of God's promises, also in verse 15, is that God would bring Jacob back to this land. If you read on to chapter 35, uh, that's when that happens. God brings Jacob back to Bethel. For each of us, coming back to Bethel... The place of God's presence is really important. For many, that's often church, the physical place, the sanctuary, the place we come on a Sunday morning. And of course, that's difficult at the moment. But we can find, with God's help, a place of encounter on the journey that we're currently on. So we can keep meeting and experiencing his presence. Closely connected with the tension of knowing God's presence 
or not knowing God's presence is being in a place of darkness. Although it does not say Jacob was in a dark place, it doesn't take much to think that he would have been. Pursued for his life, alone, his father has died and he's now off to a strange land and to a family that he has probably never met. It could well be that he was in a dark place. When we find ourselves in a dark place, we may well feel abandoned, that God is not there, that we are hopeless. We need to recognise that sometimes God does leave us. And if you have a look in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 31, it says that God left Hezekiah to know all that is in his heart. So there is a purpose sometimes in God leaving in the sense of withdrawing or hiding himself. Uh, sometimes that phrase might be, and God hid his face. It's not to abandon us, but to allow to be revealed what is really in our hearts. So there is a place of testing where God withdraws that sense of his presence to see what is in our hearts. But I don't think that's what's going on here. And we may come to that place of believing that God is no longer there. Not a place of testing of what's in our hearts, but he has gone, gone. Darkness can do that. That we feel abandoned or forsaken. That there is nothing. Perhaps we think that if there is darkness in our lives, that God cannot be present because God doesn't do darkness. You know, we read in various places, don't we, that God is light. Maybe you are in a dark place today and you think that God is not there with you. I have two words to say to you. One from 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 12, where Solomon, who I believe was speaking prophetically, said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in a dark cloud. Or the literal translation would be of that dark cloud would be in thick darkness. The Lord has said he will dwell in thick darkness. So God does abide in the dark place. And that's the second is that let us remember that the greatest work that God has done on this earth for you and for me. He did from within thick darkness during the time that Jesus was on the cross. So here is another tension, being people of the light and having a God who is light when we find ourselves in the place of darkness. There is a tension in our hearts. Why am I going on about tensions this morning? Because we all have them, especially when we find ourselves in a hard and dark place and we are struggling to know God's presence. The tension is to hold in balance what we know to be God's truth with what we feel and what our circumstances show us. To hold what we believe by faith in tension with what we see around us. And how we do this can be significant in how we progress to a place of maturity and wholeness in our lives. Solomon, who was the wisest of people who's ever lived on earth, said in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Paul says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 10 that it is with our hearts that we believe. That word believe is, is the word faith, have faith. So 
with our hearts we have faith. So our hearts are the place of faith as opposed to the place of believing which is in our minds. And the journey, as many people have said over the years, the journey between our mind and our hearts is the longest journey on earth. What we think, what we believe, to what we have faith for. We know too that our hearts are also the place of our feelings. And that's what makes it the place of tension. It's important for us to for our own emotional well-being, that we acknowledge how we feel. But it's also important for our faith that we acknowledge in our hearts the truth of who God is and what he says to us. And there's the tension. Sometimes what we, what we know to be true and have faith in what God says conflicts with how we feel. And that's especially true in the dark times and in the hard places. Our feelings conflict with what we believe. Hence Solomon's words to guard your hearts because they are the place of faith and the place of your emotional well-being. And you probably know people, I certainly do, whose faith has been shipwrecked because they were unable to manage the tension between the faith and the feelings in their heart. So to guard our hearts is to hold to the truth by faith that in Christ we are a victorious redeemed people but who still carry brokenness in the midst of a broken world. Our maturity, our freedom, our fruitfulness, how we live, how we reflect who God is, is directly connected to how we hold these tensions in our hearts. And how together we grow the community of the gospel, the community of those who hold the truth and the grace of who God is, in the midst of a broken world full of broken people. God promised Jacob that he would bring him back to this land, which he did many years later, having two wives that he worked 14 years for uh, with Laban, 11 children at that stage, about to have a 12th, plus a whole raft of servants and great wealth. God had truly blessed him. In particular, God brought him to Bethel with his whole family. He originally left Bethel on his own and he returned with this community to show them all that he had kept his promise to Jacob and to include that whole family in the promises that he had made to their father, grandfather and great-grandfather. And you can read about that in Genesis chapter 35. God was increasing and building the promises into the family and community of faith. In calling Jacob to go back to Bethel, he required of his family that they got rid of all the uh, the things that would compromise them. They had to get rid of the, uh, the idols and the gods from the local communities that they were part of. Uh, and they, they did that and they took out their earrings, which were symbols uh, of, of amulets that, uh, uh, that would bring them security and safety. And so they had to get rid of all of those things to come back to the place of God's promise. He may uh, have made the promise to Jacob, but the outworking of that promise was found within Jacob's family, within his community. Jacob alone could do this, but he could not do it alone. God has called us individually into being a temple, a place for God's presence to abide. And only I can do my part. 
but I can't do it on my own. God desires that we establish a culture within our faith community where people can enter his presence, experience his grace and see the supernatural. And this is the tension of the now and not yet that I was speaking about a number of months ago now. We have the presence of God in the person of the Holy Spirit now. We are in the era of the Spirit since Pentecost. And yet we do not see all that we know God can do. And that's attention. Attention of believing and having faith for God to be able to do all the things that we read about, particularly in, say, the book of Acts. And yet not seeing it now. Knowing that we have it available to us. And yet it's not quite happening and God is calling us to build a community where we can begin to see that happen. We do not compare ourselves with previous generations. And uh, I know that John has, has mentioned this, and we've had it, I think, at least a couple of times, uh, where uh, it talks about a, a pastor wanting to help with the church extension, uh, being left a job of cutting up some lengths of wood, and, and rather than going back to the original benchmark of the precise measure that was required, he, he just measured against the last piece of wood he'd cut. And gradually, over the hundreds of pieces that he had to cut, he was just an odd millimetre out. Uh, and, and, and over the length of all that cutting that he did, the, the pieces of wood got longer and longer and longer, only bit by bit. And, and, and the, the illustration there is simply that if we make comparison with other times and other seasons we will be misled as to where we are the only benchmark that we have is God's word and what he reveals there and again that's another kind of tension that we have to live with that we have to hold in balance that we know that God can do these things and yet we're not seeing those if you look around the world there are certainly churches that are building this kind of culture, a culture where they see the supernatural, they see God's presence perhaps more frequently than we do. It would be easy to say that we see God's presence and see the miraculous more frequently than other people do. And I'm sure that's true. But the only benchmark that we need to have is what does God word, God's word reveal to us? What does God's word show us about being a people who are of faith, who see God's presence, who experience the supernatural on a regular basis. That's the people that God has called us to be. God wants us to transform the culture that we're part of, the Christian culture that we're part of, where we are today and what we see of the kingdom today to where we see more of God's presence and more of God's power, more of the kingdom of heaven impacting people's lives. We see these things in Jacob's encounter and Jacob's life following this encounter. There are tensions in our lives. There are healings that we want to see, the miracles that we want to see, the presence that we want to experience. And this is the now and not yet of the era of the spirit that we find ourselves in. But we can learn to grow individually and together. We learn more of how to live in the fullness and the wholeness of God whilst being broken people ourselves. And that makes us the people of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's that which equips us to share the gospel with other people, recognising that we are both victorious and broken at the same time. That we can come to God and we can cry out to him and say, this is where I am. Please meet with me. Please help me to grow more in the truth. And where perhaps we have allowed 
how we feel, not that that's inappropriate to acknowledge how we feel, but where we have allowed that to supersede what God says is true, then we haven't quite held that tension in our hearts. We haven't guarded our hearts correctly. Equally, when we just pursue the truth, perhaps with little grace for how other people feel or even how our own emotional well-being is, then equally we haven't guarded our hearts well. Let us learn together as people of the gospel to be people of grace, people who live in God's presence, but also acknowledge the needs that we have for living in God's presence. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the story of Jacob and what he teaches us. Thank you for the amazing promise that you give to us through this story, that you will fulfill every promise that you have made to us. You will not leave us until all those promises have been fulfilled, completed, done. But Father, we want to bring to you those tensions that we have in our hearts this morning, perhaps even the darkness that we have there. We're struggling to know your presence. We pray for something and it doesn't happen. We're instructed to, to, to believe for all the things that you have promised to us. And yet when we ask for them, it doesn't happen as much as we would like to. Father, we thank you for all the occasions that you bless us. And the many, many, many occasions that you answer our prayers. And we rejoice in that. And in no way do we dismiss those things. But Father, we come to you and say, help us to learn even more how to build that culture of being a people who have been made whole and yet carry a brokenness because we are a people who have received by faith and faith alone the salvation, the redemption, the atonement that Jesus has wrought for us on the cross. And Father, particularly we pray this morning for those who are in that place of darkness, who feel abandoned, who feel that you're not there. Father, we thank you that you did the greatest work you have ever done on this earth in a period of darkness. You sent Jesus to die for us and he won the most amazing victory over the darkness, through the darkness. Thank you that we are a people because of that who are set free, whose chains are broken. Help us to live increasingly in that freedom. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Nigel. Let's stand and sing our final song. My 
strength is in your name for you alone can say you will deliver me yours is the victory whom shall I always by my side the one who reigns forever he is a friend of mine the God of angel armies is always by my side and nothing from the against me shall stand you hold the whole Is always by my 